Good evening, happy holidays. I'd like to talk about records that are not audiophile records. Audiophile records are really great and I understand that it's very hard to find even Liberty copies or OJC copies of Blue Note and Prestige records respectively, much less Riverside records, much less Savoy, much less Bethlehem. You can keep going back in time. All the records that aren't being reissued today, but there are plenty of early pressings, I believe, on Discogs, and there is this fetish now for audiophile pressings. You know, Blue Note does the classic vinyl series, which is not necessarily audiophile, but it really is, and the Tone Poet series, which are beautifully remastered records, of course, by Joe Holling and Kevin Gray, uh, pressed on nice 180 gram vinyl with these beautiful packages, and they sound fantastic. They don't in all instances sound like the original, but that's not Joe Harley's goal to make them sound like the originals. Because as we all know at this point, I remember when, when we didn't all know, but now it's fairly common knowledge that Rudy Van Gelder dealing with, the, with what he had in the 1950s and 60s into the 70s, uh, turntables couldn't play low bass, so he had to roll off the bass or do a little bass bump. He couldn't capture the full bass. Uh, on that he actually he couldn't press the full bass and cut with a stylus to a lacquer that he captured on tape and because he wanted his record to jump he did a little bit of a upper mid-range bump which accounts for some of the amazing dynamics of those records but for me I have a good healthy sampling of Music Matters and Tone Poet records and some Analog Productions records and I even have an even better helping of if we're talking Blue Note, Liberty, New York, 47 West 63rd pressings, and a few uh, Lexington pressings, which I will show one here. Generally speaking, these new, the new area of, uh, of audio file releases are warmer, have more bass, because they can have more bass, and they're overall very lush and warm sounding. It's not as simple as saying, we're, you know, we put these up on the tape machine and we use our computer controlled lathe to cut a lacquer. There's a whole different set of elements, unless you're ERC, which is using the absolute same vintage tube gear from the same era these records are recorded. If you're remastering records today, you're using you know, modern equipment to some degree, and you're putting those classic ancient tapes on modern machines. I'm not sure what they're using, uh, Harley and Gray. It's pretty easy to find out. I did a Miles shootout a, few, uh, a couple weeks ago, and today I wanna to do a shootout of Blue Nut Records by Kenny Burrell, Wayne Shorter, and Stanley Turrentine. I'm hoping to get the latest release of classic vinyl series records, including the Herbie Nichols records this week. I'm going into the Jazz Record Center tomorrow for a couple hours, and hopefully we'll have them. But I want to start off with this fantastic record. This is the original pressing of Introducing Kenny Burrell, which includes Tommy Flanning and Paul Chambers, Kenny Clark, and Candido. And also on one side, on Rhythm Marana, Kenny Clark and Candido. There's a little split here. You know, it doesn't have the, this was not a laminated cover. This was a frame cover, meaning you can see the literal seams of the recording. Somebody named WBF wrote his name on the back of it. Then we have the relatively recent Beautiful 2019 Tone Poet reissue, I believe this is. Yes, this is the Tone Poet. Beautiful laminate in the original Music Matters style. And I'm reviewing a pair of speakers right now, and I'll put a photo of them up here. Fleetwood DeVille speaker. They're $18,000 speakers built around a conical horn technology with compression drivers for the tweeter and an eight inch Japanese pro audio pleated woofer. These speakers are incredibly wide open from the upper mid range to the treble, like nothing I've ever heard. They're incredibly revealing. They float images, they have an amazing sound stage. They're really something. And they're doing something I've never heard before because the treble is so wide open and so detailed, there's be such beautiful separation. I am finding that many of my original pressings most of which are my early pressings, I don't have a lot of original pressings, which are in good shape, sound much closer to the Tone Poets and Music Matters than I've ever heard before, I simply, simply because the top is so wide open. It's really been sort of startling. Case in point with the Kenny Burrell, introducing. The Tone Poet has all the trademarks of a great Tone Poet, good bass, 
good sound staging, a very lush tonality overall, very clear, but the O original press is less smooth on top and has a more, the instruments are more dense. Each instrument has a little more complexity, a little more physicality to each instrument. It's a little more dynamic and these are all very slight things. It's slightly more physical, which goes along with it being a little more dense. Same sound stage, same tonality, but they sound much closer than I've heard before than through my other speakers, which speaks to the uh, work of, of uh, Kevin Gray and, and Joe Harley. It just does, how close they are, even though it's not their intention to replicate an original Rudy Van Gelder release, they're pretty damn close, with the caveat of having more bass. Everything has more, every issue in the world has more bass now and it's a little smoother and lusher overall. But there is a more of a sense of the studio, which is what I usually complain that is missing. Next up, Wayne Shorter, Music Matters pressing of Speak No Evil. Now, I am a huge Wayne Shorter fan. I think Wayne is the greatest composer. Not only is he probably the greatest com jazz composer of the 20th century, right up there with Duke Ellington, he's one of the great saxophonists, one of the great shapeshifters, one of the great imaginations of our time. And every Wayne Shorter record on Blue Note is a must. Et cetera, Adam's Apple, Schizophrenia, Speak No Evil, Night Dreamer, my personal favorite. These are all must have records. They are just, I think each one is a masterpiece. But as far as the Speak No Evil, Music Matters pressing on my system, I wrote down here, the bass is rather light. Things are a little bit forward. Good energy, good decay on the cymbals. Good cymbal detail by Elvin Jones. Oh, this is Elvin Jones, Wayne Shorter, Freddie Hubbard, Herbie Hancock, Grant Carter, Elvin Jones. Good top air, decent body of the instruments. Overall, a very physical sounding record. Then we have my Liberty UA pressing with a Van Gelder stamp. I think if it's a uh, Liberty, if it's a UA pressing with a Van Gelder stamp, it is actually a Liberty pressing. Because once you get into UA, there is no more Rudy Van Gelder. But uh, the Liberty uh, UK UA pressing compared to the Tone Poet, but it is more direct, it has better dynamics, it's smoother overall, much better bass. For some strange reason, the bass is stronger. Crescendos are more dramatic. The overall recording of this uh, UA pressing is less veiled somehow. A more complex cymbal sound, meaning I'm hearing the ping and I'm hearing the full body and ring an ambient sound coming off the cymbal. More upright bass, more gradations when he's walking, and the horns have a little more presence. As I said, these are all small things, but noticeable things. And the consistent being that the tone poets, the music matters, have more bass, and they're lusher and smoother overall. Part of which may be that they're brand new records. They're not 50 year old records that have been played by who knows who, even though I get all my records and I've uh, really old blue nuts when I get them, I clean them first on my vacuum machine, then I put them on the German system audio desk glass, whatever the heck you say it. Now this one is really interesting and I discovered something when doing this review for the next one, Stanley Turrentine, the tone poet of That's Where It's At. This came out in 2020. I also feel like all the Stanley Turrentines are also essential in a different way. If you sleep on Stanley, Tur Stanley Turrentine, you're nuts. These were party records back in the day, same as Lou Donaldson or Jimmy Smith records. There's nothing lightweight about Stanley Turrentine. You know, everything he played was perfect. He's like a Milt Jackson solo, just popping beautiful solos in his groups. This one is Les McCann, Herbie Lewis, and Otis Finch. He also did a lot with Al Harewood on drums. These are such great quartets. You know, these guys could play for a party, they could play for a hardcore jazz thing, and the music is popping. It is just popping. All the Stanley Turn stuff, Stanley Turrentin stuff. People tend to sleep on the later records. When he goes on UA and the covers become really corny, they're all great records. Idris Mahama's on some of those records. They're just, I think, I think all the Stanley Turrentines are just as essential as the Wayne Shorters. And there's a lot more of them, because he probably sold a lot more records than Wayne Shorter did. Anyway, as far as this one goes, deep bass, tight deep bass, good drum physicality and pop, very warm. The air, the upper extension of air, you know, which is the upper tier of the treble, is okay. The horns are dynamic, good cymbal air. The piano is thin. This is a prime example of the thin Rudy Van Gelder piano sound. And it's, it's, that's a truism for some strange reason. But I think Joe Harley said you know, he was doing so many strange things to baffle off that piano when it was just one open studio. Now they have a, a piano booth and a drum booth. There's a drum solo on one of these tracks that I uh, listened to, probably the first one, the first, uh, and it had tons of air. But 
This is the original OG pressing of Stanley Turrentine, where it's at. I paid $150 for this at the Jazz Record Center. This is a beautiful copy. I hope you can see it there, but this sucker is mint. Beautiful stereo copy, the first stereo copy. And what I heard on the first track, Smile Stacy, you can hear somebody, I assume Otis Finch counting off. One, two, three, four, ba ba da ba da ba ba da ba da which knocked me out. There's no count in on the Tone Poet version. So that's pretty wild. I, you know, if you go, there are lots of little strange anomalies like that on all the old Blue Note records that you're probably not going to hear on a Tone Poet, but you will hear on an original pressing. It's probably an early pressing. I don't know if, I mean, I have other versions of this, Liberties. I don't know if, if the, if the, uh, if the count-off is in there, but I don't think so. More air, more jump, more direct. The bass is less clear, but is more dense. You, it, you can hear less fingers on strings, less hand moving on the neck, but there's more weight overall, kind of chewy. The horn's a little recessed. It's less creamy overall, but there's just a truism. These original pressings still have, to me, more kick, more dynamics, more punch overall. But in listening to these new speakers that I'm reviewing that I hope I get to keep, um, I'm hearing things I've never heard before. Anyway, get out there and get that shopping done before Santa comes down the chimney and has fun with your wife. Bye!